We are still in the ancient Near East, where a symbol is a sermon, and we are trying to connect that sermon and symbol to the bigger story in the universe and point to Christ and see how that relates to our life. And um, it is very likely, because we're trying to keep it Eastern, and we're trying to focus on and emphasize the symbols and the stories, that there are a lot of questions. And um, if there weren't questions, I would be surprised. And, and we're going to go going relatively quickly through. But uh, what I'd like to do, if possible, is organize kind of a question time or discussion slash questions, whatever, for anyone who's interested, one of the evenings and the coming nights after lecture up in the gallery lounge. So if you're interested in that, uh, we'll do that. Uh, and, and some of the questions may come from things we are going to skip. So I know that we are now going to skip a very bizarre and fascinating passage uh, in order to move on to the next one. But if you're interested, because it seems like a contradiction to what we just read, we've got, you know, now Elisha's cursing people in the name of the Lord, whatever that is, and bears, and oh, just very bizarre. So, um, if you want to hear about the, the small boys, the Na'ar, as it is in that story, we, we'll talk about that when we have the question time. And we're going to move forward into a new story. And this story involves a huge problem. And it involves a desert. And it involves a war. And it involves a catastrophe. And we're going to zoom in to this story in 2 Kings chapter 3 verses 4 to 5. And if you want to turn there, uh, the, the background of what we're about to read is really simple as we look at this problem. And, and, and we have a divided kingdom, you'll remember, and, and Jehoram is the king of Israel, the northern kingdom. He's not such a good guy. Jehoshaphat is the king of Judah, and he's a pretty good guy, though I made some mistakes. And then we're going to have a third country we're going to read about in just a second. And Moab is the third country. And Moab is, is this country that's just got all kinds of sick, twisted, bad stuff going on. And a lot of terrible things happening. And they did whatever they wanted. They, of course, didn't love God or his people. Um, but they were both dangerous. And as we'll see, um, there's probably some significant darkness wrapped up in this country. And so, zooming in, 2 Kings chapter 3, verses 4 to 8. Now, Mesha, king of Moab, was a sheep breeder, and he had to deliver to the king of Israel 100,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 rams. But when Ahab died, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So back when David, King David was in charge, God knew Moab was potentially going to be a very uh, big threat to Israel, his people, and so he caused Israel to rule over them, and that's how it had been. They had to do what Israel said, and they also had to pay tribute. Well, when Jehoram takes over as the king of Israel, <clears throat> uh, they said, you know what, forget this. Moab decides, we're done. We're not going to be ruled by you, and we're not going to pay tribute to you. And this was most likely uh, the first move in what was going to become a full-scale rebellion or uprising and could cascade into involving other countries. And the king of Israel then knows if he doesn't do something when this happens, uh, there could even become... Uh, uh, the situation can escalate so that there's war on their own soil. And, and if the Moabite army were to come and start a war in his country, that would be a disaster. In North America, we don't know what it's like to have war on our own terrain in the way that some other countries do. But the truth is, if you have war in your land, it's a mess. Everything's destroyed, people are slaughtered, the country is leveled, and especially in the ancient Near East, with the kind of practices that were, were uh, engaged in by the countries of those days, you cannot afford to have that happen. So this is serious. Your entire country, your whole people, and your way of life might be about to be wiped out. So what do you do? 
you and everyone you know may be about to die. Well, this is what the king did. King Joram marched out of Samaria at that time and mustered all Israel. Some will say he numbered all Israel. He mustered the country, and then he talks to the king of Judah and says, would you please help me out? And he went and sent word to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, the king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me to battle against Moab? And he said, I will go. I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. And then he said, by which way shall we march? And Jehoram answered, by the way of the wilderness of Edom. And so we're talking about a massive problem in this story. And when this massive problem comes, we see exactly how the king does some very smart stuff. And we can make a case study out of this. The problem is an existential crisis. And in the, the first step that the king takes in order to deal with this massive problem is he looks to the numbers and begins to research. He says... How, much do I ha how many troops do I have? What do I have to work with? How, how much can I get out of my own resources? And, and, and he counts his troops, says, give me the numbers, looks at the decision. Uh, how many troops does the enemy have? How many troops do we have? We need more. Where are we going to get more troops? Which leads him to the second point, which is a very, very intelligent thing to do. Uh, if you've looked at the numbers... You've done the data analysis, and, and you realize that your resources are lacking. you got to look to improve your resources, which is what he does. He says, I need more troops, so I'm going to invite an ally. And that was the king of Judah. And third, which is very important, you've got to develop a good strategy. And that's exactly what they did. And you see this in the text. Normally, and we're not looking at a map right now, but normally if you were going to attack Moab from where they were, you would have come around the top end of the Dead Sea and you would attack from the north. So this is, of course, where the king of Moab is expecting him. You're going to come around from the north. So they said, no, we're not going to do that. While the whole army of Moab is expecting us from the north, we're going to, we're going to sneak in through the back way and we're going to surprise them and we're going to rock them. And the idea was they're going to go through the wilderness along the south end of the Dead Sea, what nobody would expect, go through this country called Adam and come up from underneath. And then they're like, while we're at it, if we're going through Adam, let's get the other, let's get Adam involved. Let's get that king involved. We'll ask him to join us. Now we're three armies. We're unstoppable. And I mean, what king in the ancient Near East doesn't want to have a good war? So he says, yeah, let's go. And so that they, they're going to sneak in there. The Moabite army is going to be surprised, realize too late. They're going to scramble. They're going to be drawn out into the wilderness. And then they're just going to destroy them and overrun the country. Brilliant. You can't lose with this strategy. And so off they go. They get their third ally, Edom, and they go to attack Moab. First strike, and everything should be great. That sounds good. But it isn't. At least, not if you belong to God. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the practicality of this later, but... It turns out that if you belong to the living God, trusting first in methods, strategies, and formulas is not going to be the best decision. And so they go out in the wilderness with this incredible strategy, and we read this. The king of Israel went with the king of Judah and the king of Edom, and when they had made a circuitous march of seven days, there was no water for the army or for the animals that followed them. And so things didn't go exactly as they planned because they're marching around in the desert in circles for seven days and they're going, uh-oh, our strategy is not working. The Moabite army is not freaking out and running into the wilderness and we have a water problem. There's no water for the troops in the desert. There's no water for the animals. There's nowhere to go. And you can't fight without water. In fact, you can't even survive in the desert without water. Seven days 
and now they are thirsty. And I don't know if you've ever been really thirsty. Maybe you've been on a hike somewhere, you've been camping, you just go up with a day without water, and you start, the thirst starts to grow and grow and grow, and then you get to this point where you almost feel panicked. And so here they are, thirsty, starting to panic. We need water, or we are going to die right here. And just as they're having that thought, they look up and realize, even worse, the opposing army is right there, creeping up, poised to annihilate them. We're going to die. And this is a huge problem. This is an even bigger problem than the first problem. And so they're really freaking out here. And the king of Israel says, alas, because that's what you do when you're freaking out. Alas, the, oh, <laughs> alas, the, the Lord has called these three kings to give them into the hand of Moab. And, and, and here he says, basically, God brought us out here to kill us. Wait, all of a sudden this now has to do with God? I mean, I guess it's pretty normal. When the plans of our flesh go bad, we like to blame God for it sometimes. And this is exactly what he does. God brought us out here to kill. No, you brought yourself out there. You didn't ask for God's involvement at all. You didn't care what God had to say. You had a great strategy. You had a great plan. You did the number analysis. You had your strategy. Good for you. But you didn't involve God in it at all. He didn't bring you out to kill you. You brought yourself out here, and now you're in a huge mess. Anybody ever experienced that? <laughs> I sure have. I make plans, I do my thing, I don't want God's input, and I find myself in a mess sometimes. And then, I like to blame God for it. God, how could you let this happen? How could you do this? How could this happen? And if I were God, then you could be thankful I'm not, I could imagine a scenario where I would say, see, look, you got what you deserved. You are officially idiots! <laughs> so, you can die in the desert. <laughs> um, because it's frustrating when people don't listen to you, people don't want your input, when you say, I'm going to help you and serve you and save you and all this stuff, and everybody's just like, you know what, how about we just ignore you? But that's not what God's like, and so there's hope. Because the story doesn't end there. And so things are desperate, and they finally decide, we're going to ask Elisha for help. And Jehoshaphat has the thought, he says, isn't there a prophet around here somewhere? Because <laughs> that's what we ask in those situations. And, and so they, they say, yes, there is this guy, Elisha. And so we're going to just kind of step forward in the story a minute, and you can picture these three kings sitting down in front of Elisha, maybe in some tent in the wilderness. They've told him the situation, we're going to die, Elisha. What do we do? And now they're holding their breath to see what Elisha is going to say. And we read this. And Elisha said, as the Lord of hosts lives before, before whom I stand, were it not that I have regard for Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would neither look at you nor see you. Oh, that's encouraging. But now... Bring me a musician. <laughs> the Hebrew is minstrel, literally musician of a stringed instrument, so harpist. Bring me a harpist. Sorry, what, Elisha? You know... You want me to bring you somebody who can play the harp? Are you crazy? People are dying of thirst. We are about to be slaughtered, and you want a harp. You are such an idiot. What a profit thing to do. What a stupid idea. Yeah, I want a harp. Because we're going to stop strategizing. We're not going to count our troops. We're not going to sit with maps anymore and figure out a good solution. We're going to stop everything, and we're going to have some time with God. And we're, in fact, going to have a little prayer and worship time. 
And we're going to ask the, the, the living God of the universe for help, and we're going to see what he says, because this, my friends, is a spiritual thing. No, it's not, Elisha. It's not a spiritual thing. This is a very, very concrete, practical problem. This is about water, and this is about spears. Now get your head out of the sky and help us here. No, it's a spiritual thing. Because all practical problems are first and foremost a spiritual thing, because everything is in some way spiritual. Now get the harp! We're on the clock! We're going to deal with this practical problem by going to the king of the universe. And we read this. When the musician played, the hand of the Lord came upon him and he said, Thus says the Lord, I will make this dry stream bed full of pools. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind or rain, but that stream bed shall be filled with water so that you shall drink, you, your livestock, and your animals. This is a light thing in the sight of the Lord. He will also give the Moabites into your hand. Well, it's kind of a funny response. This is just an easy thing for God, like a light thing, like pff, easy peasy, just what the heck. So just, you're, now that you're at the right address, you've come to the right place, this is really simple for God, ain't nothing, um, we got this. And P.S. will also give you the victory. Don't check your resources. See what you can do on your own. You have something way bigger to reckon with. And the water problem is solved. Verse 20. The next morning, about the time of offering the sacrifice, behold, water came from the direction of Edom until the country was filled with water. <laughs> what was Elisha's name again? My God is salvation. The story is just an illustration. But this is the next picture from the life of this prophet. And, and, and it, it, it's just a harp. We don't have a harp. But this is the modern day version. A guitar. And, and as I read this passage, it seems that the symbol of the harp is a picture for us to remember two things. Number one, whatever we are facing is fundamentally, in some way, a spiritual thing. Because actually everything is a spiritual thing. Now you could say, isn't that a bit overstated? Uh, I'd understand that, but I think no. It's not overstated, because, because Christ actively holds the universe together. That's something in Colossians chapter 1, 17, and we can read about. That not only by, was it by Christ that all things were created, but he is holding all the things actively together. Well, what do you mean by everything? Well, he's holding it together. Water? Yes. Flesh? Yes. Atoms? Yes. Subatomic particles? Yes. Light? Planets? Air? The whole deal. All things are spiritually sustained. Everything. And that includes matter, and that includes physics, and that includes everything else. In our universe, there's four fundamental forces. Gravity, electromagnetism, strong and weak nuclear force. And without these four fundamental forces, everything in our entire universe would just fall apart. And, and nobody knows exactly how all of these forces work together and interact, and there's actually a lot of study devoted to figuring out what the interaction is between these four forces. But there's an even bigger mystery than how gravity, electromagnetism, strong and weak nuclear force fit together. The bigger mystery is, what is the power source that enables them to work? I mean, if I take a light bulb and I you know, screw it into a, a socket for it, and then I turn the power on, I understand why the light bulb lights up. I get the mechanics of that. That makes sense to me. But there has to be a power source in order for that to happen, for the light to turn on. 
So what is the power source for electromagnetism? What is the power source for gravity? Where does this power come from that allows that stuff to work and allows the universe to hold together? What's the energy source? And there's many ideas, but one of the ideas at this point that's come up, and, and many believe this, uh, as, as new studies are done, is that really our whole universe is kind of like a little, think of it as a ball, or a little object. Everything we know, everything we can see, is just like a little object in some much larger universe that we know nothing about. And something in the larger universe is putting the energy in to our universe so that gravity works and electromagnetism works and strong nuclear force work and so that everything holds together and so that it, it, we even exist. But we have no idea what that power source is or how it works. And yet in some way, shape or form, it would appear that that power source is exactly what was spoken of in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. When it says that Jesus is actually actively holding the universe together by the word of his power. You know, it only works. And how, it, how this all functions, I have no idea. But it only works because Jesus himself empowers the strong and weak nuclear forces to hold things together. Does this have an influence on my brain? Yes. On the thoughts of someone else? Yes. On physics? Yes. On, on the water cycle? Yep. It's a spiritual thing. And it's, I, I read a fascinating article about a number of, of scientists who were involved in areas of study that relate to quantum physics. And they say, you know, we're getting to this point in recent years where our studies in quantum physics actually seem to flow out of the, the, the basin that we would call science. They flow over the edges and out of the basin that we would call science. And Without wanting to, we are in philosophy and spirituality and all this stuff because it's, you can't just contain this in a box. It's all intermixed. Which, if that's true, it would seem that regardless what I'm in the middle of, there's always time for the harp. I should be able to make time to meet with God. I mean, yeah, maybe I'm busy. Maybe we're stressed. Maybe we are in the middle of a crisis, just like this situation in the desert. And we think in the middle of the crisis and busy, stress, and terrible problems and practical spears and water problems, we, say, we don't have time for a harp. We don't have time for this ridiculous stuff. Oh, yes, we have to have time. We need to have time because God is actually the source. And, and I can't make it rain. For him, it's an easy thing. And it's funny because e even Jesus did this. Jesus is running around teaching and preaching and doing miracles and raising the dead and building a kingdom. But he's always running off to have his time with the Father by himself. There was a guest who came once to Bodensale for a church service, and we have evening services at, at Bodensale sometimes, and, and uh, we'll have kind of a time where there's, you know, worship music and, and, and then a, a little message or some sharing or something. And this guy comes, and he was uh, not from our area, but he came because he heard we had an English service, and he was there on a business trip or something. So he comes in, and, and well, <laughs> I'll never forget this. He was, he was uh, singing, and we're singing, How Great Is Our God. And so as he's singing, he's quite into the song, and he's got his hand up, and he's just, How great is our God. Uh, please delete this from the recording. Um, <laughs> and he's singing his song, and, and while he's got his hand raised in worship, and he's singing, with his other hand down here, he is writing a text on his Blackberry. <laughs> and so he's got the Blackberry in one hand, and he's got his hand up in worship in the other. And I, I'm so glad that this happened. Because for me, this is a picture 
of how I am so often divided. I'm so divided. Yes, God. Yes, me. You know, God's solution. Write a text. Worship. Too busy for that. You know, uh, spiritual, practical, so divided. And yet, I'm only harming myself. It's, it's not such a good idea because everything is in some way spiritual. And, and actually, the, one of the biggest and most epic, memorable uh, events in, in the history of God's people is something that happened that also involved water and also involved a battle. And it was a time when the people of Israel were trapped between two huge problems. In front of them, the first problem was the Red Sea. And they could not cross the Red Sea. And so they're standing at the border of this, of this body of water, and that's problem number one. And behind them, there's another problem, and that's the vast army of Egypt ready to kill them or ready to enslave them. Problem one, problem two. And what do you do in that situation? Well, of course, you, you, you figure out a strategy, you get a counsel, you say, do we fight, do we trap them, trick them, fake them? You know, let's do... And, and here's, here's Moses in Exodus 14. He says, um, God will fight for you. The Lord will fight for you. And you have only to be silent. And crazy enough, God used problem number one to solve problem number two. And, and, and God parts the waters and they walk through. And of course, we have a photo of that precise event. In the middle of a crisis, you and I have time for the harp. We, we do not have to freak out. I don't need my phone. I need a miracle. But I belong to a God for whom it is an easy thing to move. And God has to do the miracle. I can't. He's the source. He's the way. And I know that was true in this uh, sort of epic story that represents a huge chunk of God's people's story. I know that was true with Elisha, but what about for us today, 2018? I mean, honestly, we have better methods and technologies than ever before. We have better ways to solve problems and get money, and we have better medicine, more ways to help, and better ways to relax. And there are more strategies available to me than in any, any other time in history, and they're all free. Is this true for me today? Oh, yeah. Because only God can bring water in the desert. And the second message of this harp, as I consider this story is really significant for me. Because I don't have problems like this all the time, but I have a lot of problems. <laughs> of all different types. Internal, external, relational, all, all kinds of problems. And, and the second message as I consider this harp is just this. Maybe a problem is an invitation. Maybe I could begin to see a problem as an invitation. Maybe as problems come and challenges come, it, it could be something that drives me to the person of Christ. And I mean, if he's the one who's the way, the truth, and the life, and if he sustains the universe, and if he's the bread of life, and if he's the wisdom and the power of God, and if he's the savior of the world, and if he's the true king of all kings, and if he's the chief cornerstone on which all that is good is built, if, like Elisha's name says, my God is salvation, and he is, and if he loves me and cares about me and has the ability to do something about my life, why wouldn't I start by going to him? Why wouldn't I just start there? And, and so maybe problems are less problems than I think. Maybe they're less of a problem and more of an invitation. And, and I grew up thinking that it was always the case that God was there to help us with our problems. 
And I think he wants to. But maybe it's also the case that our problems help us towards God. And maybe it's a win for us if that begins to happen. What if it was an invitation to talk to and trust the living God who is what I needed anyway? And I've met a lot of people who emanate a sweetness in life. And it's like when Scripture talks about the aroma of Christ, it's like that. It's like you get with them and it's just like, yes. You're with them and you just think, good is happening right now. And they're not even doing anything. And many of these people who I've met who emanate the sweetness and goodness and life of Christ are people who've had many problems. And even terrible stuff happened. But the problems served them and served to drive them deeper and deeper in their relationship with Christ. And and it's kind of like a board with a screw. You know, you twist the screw and you twist the screw and you twist the screw. And with every twist and with every turn, it goes deeper and deeper and deeper into the board. And it's like the problems in their lives did that for them. And somehow something beautiful came out of it. And, And I see this whole story as a picture of that in one way because... Where did all of this happen? The whole story takes place in the desert. The incredible victory and rescue took place in the desert. In the wilderness of Edom. And in Hebrew, the word for wilderness, midbar. It's actually kind of a, 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 a mixture of, this, of two ideas. It's like the place, and, and, and the place of, of words or of speech. And so the, the actual Hebrew word for wilderness is the place of words. You can't talk about the wilderness in the Hebrew language without saying it is the place of words. That's the desert. It's built into the language itself. And and if our problems turn us to Christ, and if the desert drives us back to him, it could be the place that God actually ends up speaking to you the most. It could be that you experience some of your most intensive fellowship with God in the desert. I don't like the desert. I don't want to go in the desert. In fact, I hate the desert. I, if I could avoid all problems, I would. I'm so sick of them. Be honest with you. But maybe there's redemption in them if they begin, as the harp reminds me, to point me back to Christ. Anybody have a story, and, and, and maybe just in, in just a minute or two to summarize, a story where you discovered, I was in the desert in some way, shape, or form, and something happened that was terrible, but it brought me back to Christ and he did something. Anybody have a story like that? Or a situation like that that you'd be willing to share? Because I don't think these are the only people who've experienced a difficult thing driving them back to Christ. I can give you this. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was not really a Christian. I pretended to be a Christian. Um, I thought I was one. But I knew that my life as it was was not, not godly and not how it pleases God. And then actually he let my dad die when I was 16, but through it, I first started talking to him. I yelled at him, I discussed with God, or I I fought against him in words, but actually that was the first time when I actually spoke to him, so that was the desert and something bad happened, but that turned me to God in a personal relationship. Well, thanks for being willing to share that. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? 
to run this back to you. Thanks. OK, I don't know why I'm doing this, because I'm really nervous. Um, so um, I, I went to church, but I didn't really, um, I hadn't given my life to God. I didn't, like, I didn't believe in him. I didn't involve him. He wasn't a priority in my life. And then I went through a lot of hard stuff. And last year, I struggled with anorexia. And I was so angry because I tried with my own forces to solve everything. And I said, the doctors are going to do something, and I'm going to be fine. And then I realized that the only way was with God. And he changed my life completely. And through my sickness or my disease, um, my relationship with him just grew stronger. And yeah, that's it. Thanks for sharing. Appreciate your willingness. Yeah. One more. Somebody else experienced something like that? All right, you guys can fight over it. No. Um, so when I was in high school, I focused primarily on sports and academics. Those were the main thing for me. Um, and my senior year of high school, I had a, my third concussion, which um, took me out of sports for the rest of the year. And I had to drop all of the AP courses that I was taking. Um, and I missed a month and a half of school. So that time was like, it was really difficult for me because I couldn't do any of the things that I thought that I was best at. Um, so I was depressed for like several months. Um, and it was just really a time of me questioning God, like, why did you do this to me? These were the things that I took pride in, the things that I thought that I was good at. Um, but it really helped me to reflect on like why, why I was doing um, life the way that I was and what things I really should take pride in. Mm -hmm. And that would be my faith in God. Thank you. Yeah. I would guess that there would be many stories like that. And we don't tell these stories to, to talk about the fact that we love problems or that it's OK or that it's good that bad things happen. That's not what we're saying. And we don't say these stories to each other to, to uh, indicate that God is causing all these problems. Firemen always show up where the house is burning. So where the house is burning down, the firemen are there. But that does not mean that the firemen started the fire. So we don't want to say, God did this, and God did this, and God did this. But where stuff is happening, and we don't know what God is doing. I mean, that's a whole separate subject. But we don't want to just assume that he's causing all the problems. Job's life. Sometimes we attribute Job's problems to God, but who was the one who caused them? Not Job. Or not God. But whatever happens, however it all works, God's redemptive power is often released as we come back to him. And I encourage us to keep telling stories about this because um, we, we all have them, or many of us do. And I could tell you stories that in, in, in our lives, April and I have experienced deserts that relate to depression and anxiety, that relate to severe medical conditions and pain and problems and operations and stuff with our kids. And they're not good. I don't like the desert. But sometimes those are the things that have brought us into intensive fellowship with Christ. And we'll close with one last thing, uh, because we have to be honest about this. And, and, and while the main symbol of this story is, is the harp, there's also another symbol, not explicitly in the story, but implicitly. And that is a shovel. Where is the shovel in here? Well. Different translations translate 2 Kings 3.16 differently. But I think the best translation would be what many of you have if you use NASB, NIV, King James, most German translations, most Hebrew scholars. God's command after the harp is, make this valley full of ditches. <laughs> 
And so, in order to make the valley full of ditches, you've got to send a whole ton of people out with shovels, probably in the hot sun, to go dig. And, and it's kind of funny because while I believe the main story of this is, uh, 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 the main element of this story or symbol is the harp, it's all about God. It's his supernatural power. He has to do it. We live. It's all spiritual. It's an invitation to go to him. He has to do it. It turns out that we can expect people who bank on the supernatural power of God and who know that it's spiritual and who are living out of the source and know that he's the one who can provide the water and, and do all that uh, that only he can do. It turns out that people who bank on that, you will often find them doing stuff, holding a shovel, working. And, and this is one of the tensions, I think, of faith, is we know it's all God, and yet there's things we got to do. And, and so I don't want to ignore that, although I don't think it's the main symbol. Some of us are shovel people, and we just ignore the harp. Uh, but it could be that some of us when the time comes to pick up the shovel, are a little slow to do so. And it turns out in this story, because a flash flood filling a wadi in this region uh, can be a huge problem, it turns out that if they hadn't dug those ditches, the supernatural provision of the water that saved them could have actually wiped out their camp. And so, although faith, I believe, always begins with the harp, and we live out of the source. Sometimes those who live in faith and live out of the source and reckon with the supernatural power of God are working with a shovel. And we want to close, Father, by just submitting this conversation to you because when we talk about the things which are difficult, those are usually personal. And Lord, we want to say thank you that you are available and when we get ourselves into a mess or we find ourselves in a mess through no fault of our own, we want to learn to be people increasingly who recognize that everything is spiritual in some way, shape, or form or another and allow that to lead us back to you. And where we don't have faith for that and where we can't believe that, help our unbelief. And where we wrestle it with the pain and struggle of problems and are not okay with it and sometimes do yell and scream at you as we've heard. Father, help us to move forward in that and see your redemptive power in our lives and in the world that we would be people living as people of faith. In your name, Jesus. Amen.